All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 299. Day by day, with each passing moment. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toll with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power, the protection of his chosen treasure, is a charge that on himself he laid. As thy days, thy strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then in every tribulation. So to trust thy promises, O Lord. That I lose not face sweet consolation. Given me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from a father's hand. One by one, the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. For our scripture reading commentary, let's turn together to Hosea chapter 12. Remember that Hosea was a prophet that the Lord raised up. He was contemporary with Isaiah. Both prophesied to the northern kingdoms and both experienced the judgment that the Lord brought against the northern kingdoms tribes of the north because in spite of the prophecy they would not hear and that's always the case where God leaves men to their own devices they will not hear the word and so here Hosea addresses this word to Ephraim remember that's the name of the whole of the ten tribes of the north because Ephraim led the way in their rebellion. And it says, Ephraim feedeth on wind and followeth after the east wind. He daily increaseth lies and desolation. And they do make a covenant with the Assyrians and oil is carried into Egypt. So here we have a picture of them, in spite of the impending judgment, still looking to the arm of the flesh. That's why when it says Ephraim feedeth on wind, that's another way of just saying that Ephraim had bolstered herself with vain hopes of help from man, which is no more than vanity, and thinking that somehow they would find some sort of security with the Egyptians that are mentioned here in opposition to Assyria, making a covenant with Assyria, but at the same time looking to the Egyptians to protect them, all these false alliances, such as the works of men. And it can only bring ultimate destruction. So, he declares here, the Lord also hath a controversy with Judah. All the while that he's prophesying to those 10 tribes of the north, 
Here's Judah, considered as the sister of Israel, that is following in her footsteps. And so the Lord's controversy is with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his doings. Will he recompense him? So here it takes, he takes issue with Jacob and goes all the way back to Jacob's beginning as an example of deceit, because you have to remember that the name Jacob means that, supplanter. It says he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. To grasp the heel is another way of saying going behind someone's back in order to deceive them or trick them, and in the end, dominate them. So here through Hosea, God is saying that Jacob then is who the Israel is now at that particular time. No difference. Man is man. And unless God is pleased to show mercy and grace, and we know that's the only reason Jacob was able to prevail with God, as it says there, by his strength, he had power with God is because of how God had blessed him. Already said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. But in his strength, he's referring to that time that he wrestled with God. And that's what the prophet here is recalling. When he would not at that point submit to God until the Lord literally brought him into submission. It says, yea, he had power over the angel. Verse 4, over the messenger. We recently studied this in Genesis in one of the Saturday morning preaching services that I had. And we saw where that angel was none other than Christ himself. When it says angel, a messenger with God, that was God's dealing with Jacob, that he was that, Christ was that messenger. He prevailed only because the Lord himself caused him to prevail until it was time to bring him into complete submission. That's often how the Lord deals with those that he's drawing to himself. It's not instantaneous because we all have this flesh. We'll wrestle with God in this flesh, but ultimately the Lord will bring to bow every one of those that he's purposed to save. This is what Hosea then is reminding the 10 tribes of the north that they're just like Jacob and Jacob just like the 10 tribes of the north that until or unless the Lord brings them into submission, they will always rebel. They will always fight with God. And that's what they're doing here in spite of all of the warnings of the scriptures that we find here. The carrying of these away into captivity was imminent, and yet they continued to act as if they could somehow get out from under it. And so it refers back to that time when Jacob wrestled with God. It says, ye had, he, yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. But then what? He wept and made supplication unto him. There's some that the Lord brings to bow in grace, which he did with Jacob. There's others that he brings to bow in judgment, which was what was about to happen here with the 10 tribes of Israel. It says he found him in Bethel and there he spake with us, even the Lord of hosts. The Lord is his memorial. What Hosea is doing is reminding them just how far afield they've gone from that time in God's dealing in Christ with Jacob to what now they are. And uh, we can never presume upon the grace of God. There are many congregations even that have begun or first began with the gospel, hearing it, rejoicing in it. And yet, like Paul wrote to the Galatians, I marvel that you're so soon turned from him who called you by his grace unto another gospel. 
And we know that those that are truly the Lord's, they cannot ever be completely taken away. But there are many that hear the gospel. Israel knew well this story of Jacob and how the Lord dealt kindly with them, mercifully with them. And yet it meant nothing to them at this point. They've forgotten the, the roots from which they had come. And so the call here, though, in verse 6, Therefore turn thou to thy God. This is the call to turn to Christ. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. That's the call of the gospel. It's a command. This is not Hosea begging them. He just reminded them that unless God is pleased to show you mercy, then you're going to know a very bitter end. So turn thou to thy God. There's no other God to turn to than the one true and living God in Christ. Keep mercy and judgment. We see those two words together. That's a picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, where righteousness and peace have kissed one another. And mercy. For God to show mercy, there has to be judgment. It has to be on the substitute. And where judgment is exercised, then God shows mercy. But wait on thy God continually. That's not for us to determine whether he's going to show mercy or will bear our judgment. That's him. So we wait on our God so many preachers today that are in a hurry to get people to do something, to act. You've even heard of some preachers that say, get down on your knees and don't get up until you've dealt with God, you've closed with God, and you're sure of your salvation. Well, that's not for us to determine. It's like this hymn writer wrote, could our tears forever flow? That doesn't say, thou must say, thou alone. So the call here is for them to look to Christ. But it's evident, even as Hosea has been preaching to them this time, the judgment is imminent. When he says here, he is a merchant, He's speaking here of Ephraim. And the word also signifies a Canaanite. If you look it up in the original, he is a Canaanite. You know, the Canaanites were in the land, and that's what they did. They were merchants that went from place to place selling their wares. Well, this is what God is calling them, that they're no better than the Canaanites among whom the Lord delivered them initially. Just going from place to place, just like here, seeking a covenant with the Assyrians, even though God had purposed to destroy them by the Assyrians, and then going down into Egypt sending oil down into Egypt. All the propagating of wares, just like a, a merchant. And we see the same today. We've got the merchandising of the name of Christ, the name of God, and, and people going about trying to build up their own little fiefdoms and kingdoms and feeling secure and these things, thinking that somehow God's blessing, but they're nothing more than merchants. The same that the Lord went into the temple and chased out money changers in the temple, sought not the glory of God. Such was their case. The balances of deceit are in his hand, and he loveth to oppress. All of that self-serving, where the grace of God is absent, then it's always going to be self-serving and with the view of becoming rich verse 8 yet Ephraim said yet I am become rich in reality they were about to be carried away by the Assyrians and never again to dwell in that land and yet in their false assurance they considered themselves to be rich they say, I found me out substance in all my labors. They shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. That was their view of themselves. Sounds a lot like religion today. They made their profession. Now they're busy about building up their, their works. Notice in all my labors. That's what they're looking at 
looking at is their their riches and they consider themselves to be in good standing especially when things are good financially see that on the front of these late model vehicles God did it blessed of God it's the religion of health wealth and prosperity it existed back then oh the deception not only were they given to deception just like in religion people go about deceiving and promoting a false faith people are blinded by it they think they're safe in it but the Lord says here verse 9 and I that am the Lord thy God of the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feasts. Whatever you've built up, he's taken them back all the way into the wilderness when they did dwell in tabernacles. And it's not in a good sense when you read that. What the Lord is saying here, even though they enjoyed financial prosperity and fine homes at the time that Hosea was prophesying, he's saying God in his judgment will bring them again into exile like they were in the wilderness and dwell in those humble tents again, everything else taken away. And this judgment is certain because it's spoken of by the prophets. It wasn't just Hosea that was prophesying. We saw this. It's Micah. It's, it's Isaiah. I have also spoken by the prophets. I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. And yet for all that, they would not hear. Again, it's like today, the Bible, this word that we're reading here, it's in the majority of homes of people that consider themselves Christian, and they're quite well off. And they think that by their own profession and following after their religion that somehow they're safe. But there's coming a day when all of that will be exposed and stripped away. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity. When he's speaking of Gilead, you go back and look at Gilead, that was a place where the Lord had his altar, where sacrifices at one time were being offered unto the Lord. But when he is asking the question, is there iniquity in Gilead? He's saying there is iniquity in Gilead. What happened? That altar that had been unto the Lord now had been turned into pagan altars. That's why he says, surely they are vanity. They sacrifice bullocks in Gilgal. Yea, their altars, says, are as heaps in the furrows of the fields. This is forward looking. Now, when judgment comes, and it wasn't far off, when this prophecy was being made, it was less than... 50 years left of existence that Hosea is preaching. And so he's saying, when judgment comes, God brings that judgment, all those altars will be like furrows in the, of the fields, plowed under. Anything you trusted in for your confidence, there'll be nothing but furrows in the field. God will have no rivals. And though he lingers in his forbearance before he brings judgment, yet all those that follow after false worship, false way, false profession, the end will most certainly come. And so verse 12, Jacob fled into the country of Syria. It's still going back to Jacob's story. What did Jacob, when he left there in Bethel, and fled into Syria. It's talking about when he was fleeing from Esau and he fled to his uncle Laban in Syria. It says, and Israel served for a wife and for a wife he kept sheep. What he's saying is that the very same way that Jacob initially was sent into exile for those 21 years that he was there before the Lord brought him back, he's telling Ephraim, he's telling these 10 tribes of the north that that would be their lot. And by a prophet, 
the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt and by a prophet was he preserved. And he's speaking of by a prophet. He's talking here about Moses. He's going back into their history. How is it that you came to where you are today? It's by the Lord's directive. How is it that you're being preserved? It's not because of anything in you. It's because the Lord purposed to preserve you. That's God's forbearance. We often wonder, well, why doesn't God just destroy sinners? Well, in his forbearance, he deals with them until such time as either he purposes to draw them to Christ. We don't know who's his and who's isn't, but or all the while, like Paul writes to the Romans, they're heaping up wrath upon wrath against the day of wrath. But either way, it's the Lord who's doing it. And so Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. How is it that he was provoked to anger? This is not God reacting, but this is God acting in his just wrath and anger toward any who in spite of all the prophets, all that this word declares, they still persist in going their way and following after their own will. You don't want to be left to your own will. I know people reason that way. They say, well, why does God make the decision as to who he saves and who he doesn't? Well, if God didn't, there'd be none saved. It's God determined in his grace who he will save. And the rest, he passes by and condemns. And so here, Hosea is warning them. In light of all of this history, going all the way back to Moses, all the way back to Jacob, and all that, how God preserved him, yet here you are in this hardened state today. He says there in verse 14, therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. Is God just in condemning sinners? Absolutely. It shouldn't surprise us to hear Esau I hated. What ought to marvel us is to hear Jacob have I loved. But if God ever leaves sinners to themselves, then there's nothing but certain judgment and condemnation for their rebellion and sin. May the Lord be merciful and ever draw our hearts to Christ. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. It's always a solemn passage to read and to understand how it is that you deal with sinners in their rebellion and uh, that these thought themselves safe in spite of all the warnings from the prophets, yet they continue to confide in their history and who they were, and confide in the works of their flesh and confide in the sense of prosperity as you prospered them for a time and yet all that only harden them. We know that if you are to leave us to ourselves, that would certainly be our story. But I thank you for the Jacobs. I thank you that there are those that you have purpose to save and have saved through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and them you will bring. Christ having borne that sin debt already in the mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed one another. Our only hope's in him. I pray that you would continue to bless our meeting together, teach us more of your grace, more of the, the beauty of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. And it's in his precious name I pray, amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 326 him to follow what we've just read more about Jesus, what I know. Three hundred and twenty six. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. 
More of His love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died for me. More about Jesus let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness, see. More of his love who died for me. More about Jesus in his word. Holy communion with my Lord. Hearing his voice in every line. Making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, see, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne, riches in glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming, Prince of Peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness, see. More of his love who died for me. Let's look in our Bibles together in 2 Kings chapter 18 text of this message is taken from verse 1 down to verse 8. Here we have a new king that is raised up by the name of Hezekiah. So this message is to show us how Hezekiah is a type of Jesus Christ. In reality, all of the prophets, priests, and kings of the Old Testament represent the Lord Jesus Christ in their office and some as anti-types, obviously the evil kings show the contrast with Christ the true king, in whom was no evil. But at the same time, we have examples such as Hezekiah and others that we've seen, particularly in the lineage of Judah. Of all of the 10 tribes of the north, not one king, it was said, was did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord because they followed after idolatrous practices. But here we see one the Lord raised up whose name is Hezekiah. And it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel. So that Hoshea would have been the last of the kings of the, the north before the Lord took him into captivity. But while he was reigning, the Lord raised up Hezekiah to follow after his father Ahaz. It says there in verse 1 that Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, that he began to reign. So in the third year that Hoshea of the north started his reign, Hezekiah, the Lord raised him up to reign. The name Hezekiah means strength is of the Lord. Strength is of Jehovah. That's what his name means. And so we can gather from that that Hezekiah's accession here to the ascension to the throne wasn't due to anything in himself. This again was the Lord purposing that there would be a king of Judah. You say, what was so special about Judah? Well, it's because God had promised. David, that there would be a king that would be from that lineage that would be his seed. 
and that king would be none other than Christ himself. And so it's with interest that we read that every time we see Judah, even though the Lord would take Judah into captivity, just like he did with the 10 tribes of the north, the difference is he brought them back. Whereas the 10 tribes were not brought back. And the Assyrians came and intermingled, intermarried with them. And that's where we get the race of the Samaritans. They were not considered by the Jews to be a pure race because they were intermingled with the Assyrians. But God purposed that because the Jews in their self-pride thought themselves better when Christ came because they were of that lineage. And yet the Lord reminded them, no, it's not because of anything in you, but it's of his promised Abraham and to his seed, which is Christ. So here, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, was 25 years old. And when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Here's one of those instances again where it mentions his mother's name also was Abai. If you go over into Chronicles, it's Abijah. And it speaks of her father, one who belongs to the father, is what the name really means, the daughter of Zechariah. Some question, well, why put this information in here? I believe it's to show that this Hezekiah was of that lineage of David. If you go back and look at all the descendants of going back to David, this is the lineage of Christ. Therefore, the precision that this wasn't just somebody, because there are actually in the Bible, if you look at it, three other men called Hezekiah. So it was important that this particular Hezekiah be known as, as that one that the Lord had raised up who would be of that lineage of David. And it says here in verse three that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. That's an important statement. And this is why I say Hezekiah serves as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he was a king of Judah Christ is the line of Judah, and he ascended to Judah's throne. Right now, as we're studying this, if you're interested in timelines, this would be somewhere around 700 to 686 before Christ. You think about that, that all of these promises made to David, the Lord was fulfilling in his time, and all the way down to in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those that were under the law. All this is showing God's sovereign providence and, and will in accomplishing what he had promised. And it says there in verse 4, this shows how he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. He was... Hezekiah, this is another way in which I see Hezekiah as a type of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and that he was faithful to God, his father. It says there, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. That's the name for Jehovah God. It wasn't from him, but it was God who purposed that he should be faithful. It's the faithfulness of God for him that caused him to be faithful to God according to all that David, his father, did. We know David was a sinner just like all of these. So this is where you have to understand these types go so far. But in the type, in their office, in their function, what they did, that he was raised up to the glory and honor of, of God. He reigned 14 years before his severe illness that we're going to read about later. And then after that, 15 years beyond that. So the Lord extended his life, even though it appeared that the Lord had 
purpose to take it. But here's another way in which I believe he serves as a type of Christ in that he stood against all the idolatrous practices and uh, reinstituted the true worship of God in the temple. This was before the temple would be destroyed a couple hundred years later. We're in 700 before Christ and it was 560 some that finally Judah was taken into captivity by the Babylonians and that temple was destroyed. But I think of our Lord Jesus Christ, just like here we're going to read about Hezekiah, when our Lord came into his temple. So the first temple of Solomon would be destroyed. And then after Judah was brought back from captivity, it was rebuilt by Zerubbabel. And that was the temple in which the Lord entered. Because that temple had to exist until Christ came and fulfilled it. That's why he said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it again. He's spoken parables. That temple had to be destroyed, but the rebuilding would be in Christ. The fulfillment would be in the Lord Jesus Christ. But our Lord in coming to this earth stood against all that that false worship represented in his day. Here we find that it says in verse four, how Hezekiah then demonstrated his faithfulness to the one true God. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves. These were all going on, just like up in the north. That's why we read in Hosea that the, the prophecy was for Ephraim, but also for Judah, following in, in the same path. It says he cut down the groves. These were places where other gods were worshipped, right along with the temple worship. What was in existence was a mingling of a semblance of, of the true worship of God and yet level, mixed in with all the pagan worship together. It was compromised. And especially here, we read in verse 4, among the things that were destroyed, it says he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Ever wonder what had happened to that brazen serpent? Well, they, they made a god out of it. It's like anything that men do. They'll, they'll begin to worship the, the creature and not the creator. For unto those days the incense of Israel did burn, the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nahushta. So, this would have been some 800 years that this was going on. And what Hezekiah did then was to take and break that in pieces, the brazen serpent, and to burn incense to it. And he, that is Hezekiah, called it Nehushta. And if you look up Nehushta, it means just it's just brass. That's what it literally means. It's just brass. It's not to be worshipped. But all this time, they had taken and made this bronze artifact to be part of their idolatrous worship. Now, you stop and think about what the brazen serpent represented. Again, it was a, a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We studied this recently going through John chapter 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. A lot of people wonder, well, why or how could a bronze serpent represent the Lord Jesus Christ being lifted up in death? Well, it, it, the, the serpent represents condemnation. And yet it was a bronze serpent. It wasn't a, a real serpent. He didn't take a living serpent and put it up on the pole. 
to indicate that when the Lord Jesus Christ hung on that cross, it wasn't that he actually became sin, but it was represented in that bronze serpent. He was made in the likeness of sinful men, but he wasn't made sinful. And yet it was necessary that he endure the curse. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where it was announced there in, in the garden in the fall that the serpent, the seed of the serpent, the serpent would, would bite the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman, which is Christ, would crush his head. That was a picture of that condemnation. But so often, things that we look upon, that the Lord has given us, given to men, they will turn it into idolatrous worship. It's, you look around at what's going on in Christendom today with crosses, pictures of Jesus, all of these emblems that people have in their places of worship. I was talking to a man one time, and I told him that was idolatry, and he told me, he said, no, no, we, it's not that we're worshiping these things, that we have the crosses and these pictures, and I said, well, then why don't you burn them? Oh, no, we couldn't do that. That tells you right there, just like Hezekiah here, this was to be burnt. Because they, and destroyed, because they had burnt incense unto it. It's nothing but brass. That's what Nehushan means. We have people today trying to go back and actually find the burial cloth. They're looking for any objects that they can worship and put in their places of worship. Someone said one time that if you took every relic of what men call a piece of that cross, that wooden cross. Because there are a lot of places around the world where you can go and they've got them in these little display boxes and they let you know that's a piece of Christ's original cross. That if you combine every one of those relics throughout the world, it would be have a tree taller than a sequoia tree. Even more. But that's the stupidity, that's the depravity, whereby there's more fascination with artifacts. Just like here, fascination with the with the brazen serpent rather than with the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and why he came, and what he accomplished. When Paul declared that he would not glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, he wasn't talking about a piece of wood. He wasn't talking about a piece of jewelry that you take and hang around your neck as if that's some form of worship that is pleasing to God. No, there's not anything. There, you should, thou shalt not make any graven image before the Lord. The people do it. They're all pictures of how they think that Jesus would have looked. But all of that needs to be taken and broken in pieces because it's nothing but idolatry. So we have to guard against it. But it's not just objects of, of worship. There, there are many dangers of idolatry I've mentioned before. Where is idolatry? It's in the heart. And it begins with the word I. It's self-serving. Today, people make idols out of their their leaders, their preachers, when the scriptures clearly warn against it. They make an idol out of their understanding and knowledge, or at least what they think is true. And they make an idol out of practices. If you look over in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 23, all of these things are due to the traditions of men customs of men and not after God. Here in Colossians chapter 2, it says there in verse 20, wherefore if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, how are you dead with Christ? Well, when he died, 
He put away every rule and every law that pertain to, to salvation. These are the commandments that stood against us. And if he be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, this is talking about what people pursue. Why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Either Christ finished the work or he didn't. That's really what the brazen serpent was about. The future coming, doing, dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by it, those who were given eyes to look to that brazen serpent were healed. And yet, what did they do? They went back and took that brazen serpent and made an idol of it. It's like people today that they see what the scriptures say about Christ having finished the work. And you know what's the first thing they do? They go back and start building up their own works, such as here, touch not, taste not, handle not. Christ is being preached in such a way as they say, well, it, it covers your sins up to the point of your conversion, but after that, then you've got to do this or you've got to do that in order to maintain your salvation. Paul's very clear about it in verse 22, which all are to perish with using. Anybody that begins to go back to any sort of additional devotions or rules or regulations as if somehow, like some say, well, we're justified by his death, but we're sanctified by our doing. Well, there you go. That's going back to the rudiments of the world. And it says, which all are to perish with the using. There's no hope in anything that man purports to be of significance, importance, just like that brazen serpent, offering incense unto it. But like Hezekiah renamed it, said Nehushtan. I mean, it's just brass. After the commands and doctrines of men, now, verse 23, here it is. This, is. this is what's so deceptive because it has an appearance of wisdom. For those that were following, it had some historic value, but not before God. It says, which things have indeed a show of wisdom, but what? In will worship. That's very important. Not in true worship, but in will worship. What's will worship? That's what they call free will today. and humility and neglecting of the body. These are things that talk about neglecting the body, fastings, other things seeking extra blessing from God apart from what Christ has already accomplished. But it says not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It doesn't even satisfy the flesh. When they finish that, they got to come back and keep going. There's no value in it. But all of these are, are forms of idolatry in will worship. You won't find this in places where God has given his grace to look to Christ alone, but you sure find it in other places that give lip service. And yet, they're idolaters. Over in Mark chapter 7, verse 8, just looking at a couple of scriptures. And here, here we see our Lord Hezekiah being a type of our Lord and how he stood against the idolatry of his day. Not only did he remove the high places, you see there's some idolatry that is pretty evident. So when you preach against it, people are like, oh yeah, preach it brother. But then you get down to something like here, the brazen serpent. Let's get rid of the brazen serpent too. Let's get rid of any tradition no matter how right it seems amongst those that call themselves Christian, air quotes, call themselves Christian, no matter how right it seems, it still needs to be denounced as idolatry. Here in Mark chapter seven, our Lord calls it vain worship. Speaking of these Pharisees, and you talk about touch not, taste not, handle not, boy, they had to, upper hand on this. When they saw some of the disciples, verse two, eat bread with defile, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. 
I don't think this means they just came in and sit down and, oh, I better wash my hands and clean up. There was a ceremony that they went through, dipping their fingers on up to the knuckles in a water that had been set apart for this purpose. And they believed that they were purifying themselves because they'd been out in the marketplace, out in the world. But what did that say? The world's wicked, but I'm not. But I got to keep myself pure. There's lots of that type of practice. People have always talk about what's wrong out there. And so now when we get in amongst ourselves, we got to purify ourselves because we've been out in the world. It says for the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, many others. This is all idolatry, which they have received the whole as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. When the, then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Everybody has a tradition in religion. And he answered and said unto them, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites as it is written that this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Here it is. How be it? In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. I dare say you don't have to go into these places of worship to see it. You can just get online and just Google different traditions and, and things that are called Christendom, but you can see it. It's, it's from the leaders on down. Dressed up in a different way, and doing their incense and all this stuff. But it has to be denounced as Hezekiah did. That name Nehushtan. Just a piece of brass. That's what he's done. It's just a piece of brass. Vain worship. It's nothing but scrap metal. You want to get people upset today, just bundle it all into that. Nothing but scrap metal that people call worship. Such was the venom of this idolatry with which they were smitten. But it was worse than when it first began. Here again we see how Hezekiah serves as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ because in verse 5 he stood against all of that tradition just like our Lord did. Wouldn't join with it. Wouldn't have anything to do with it. Denounced it. Read Matthew 23. That whole chapter. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Here Hezekiah stood alone, just like our Lord did. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel. It says here, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. That's what struck me as I was reading this. Yeah, we had others that it speaks of them having done right in the eyes of the Lord, but here was one unlike any to that point or after him. I would say the same with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's none like him before him or after him because he is the true prophet of God. He's the true priest. He's the true king. And what's remarkable is that Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz. And you have to realize that Ahaz did not follow in the ways of the Lord. But here the very fruit of his loins is one that the Lord raised up and did. That shows that where the Lord is pleased to set one apart, that and even in that, our Lord Jesus Christ, people try to make Mary to be immaculate because they can't understand how the Lord could bring one such as the Lord Jesus Christ from her womb. Well, he did it in a miraculous way. He put that seed in her. She was as much a sinner as any of them. But from that womb came forth 
the Lord Jesus Christ to serve for the honor and glory of the Lord, his Father. And that was his doing. So even in this, we can see how the Lord was with him. It says in verse 6, He clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. That typifies the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his obedience in all things, which was necessary for him to be the savior of his people. Again, in type, we know that, as we're gonna read on, Hezekiah faltered. But as far as his office is concerned, and as far as what is stated here, and this is the Lord's testimony of him, we can draw many parallels between him and how he claimed to the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ. He was tempted in all things, yet without sin. The type has to go, but the, the reality, the truth is that it is in Christ. That's our hope. That our Lord Jesus Christ truly did keep the commandments. Every one of them that have been commanded, not one left undone. That's what Christ said. He didn't come to set the law aside, but to fulfill it. You see this typified here. So the Lord was with him. It truly could be said of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what his name means. God with us. God was with him. And he dwelt among us. The Lord was with him and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. Our Lord never bowed the knee to any earthly king. It got out of upset, but he would not even bow to Pilate's wishes. Pilate said, don't you know I have authority to crucify you? And the Lord told him he would have no authority but what was given to the Father. He smote the Philistines, even on the Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the Tower of the Watchmen to the fence of the city. So what a beautiful picture we have here where the Lord was pleased to bless him completely and uh, fulfilled that long-standing promise that God had made to David to raise up a seed. This is a precursor to that seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, even as Christ can come and subdue his enemies. Thank God that the biggest enemy of all was the sin of his people. And yet he subdued it, not in turning it away or turning away from, from it, but taking it upon himself, bearing that charge for that iniquity and thereby putting it away. I pray the Lord will bless what we've heard and certainly much more there than I've been able to touch on, but may the Lord grant us eyes to see Christ in and through it all. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 256. 256. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is with my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul though Satan should buffet though try should come. Let this blessed assurance control 
that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul, it is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste a day when my face shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back. As a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. All right, well, have a good evening. We look forward to next time, Lord willing.